Hello friends and welcome back to Club C Club's podcast. My name is Jess, your host, and today we continue with our contributor series, deep dives into conversations with folks who are early contributors to many of the DAOs you know and love. Today we're joined by Mark Redito, who's a core contributor to Song Camp, which I think just kicked off their third camp, Camp Chaos, this week. So if you haven't checked them out, go give them a shout. Mark is an early contributor to Web3, but we get into some conversation about what he was doing before he made the leap. We dove into the conversation around trust building in community and what that looks like from Mark's perspective. You'll see Mark is a very thoughtful human being in this matter. We talk about resolving conflicts in DAOs versus traditional organizations and spoke specifically about the social and human aspect of DAOs versus the technological one. Mark shares a bunch of resources about where he's looking for inspiration and where his philosophical ideas emerge from. It was a lovely Saturday afternoon conversation where Mark and I finally got a chance to go deep on some of these things, and I think you'll enjoy it. So let's jump into it. Mark, welcome to club. Thank you, Jess. Thank you. I'm so excited for this conversation because we've seen each other, we've hung out with each other, but haven't had a chance for a one-on-one. And so this is such a good space to do that. <laughs> yeah, I think it's funny because I was thinking about preparing for this chat and I'm like, I'm not going to prepare for this chat because I think there's just like this abundance of raw material for us to get into. And yes. Yeah, know you from your work. A lot of people have amazing things to say about you. Obviously, big fan of Song Camp and the amazing work that's being done over there. So let's just kick off. How do you introduce yourself these days? Well, I introduce myself usually with the roles that I play or my interests. And so I would quickly introduce myself as an artist, a technologist, and a community builder, and also a gardener. So that's those are sort of like the this, the containers that I sort of like share with people. All right. And where are you applying those containers these days? In pursuit of what? My main contribution right now is with Song Camp. I guess in Song Camp, we call ourselves designers. And so my role is that of a community and operations designer. I think that with my background as an artist, I think that these roles carry a certain creative spirit in them, especially in the context of like Web3, where there's no playbook yet, and we're all figuring out best practices. I feel like that's such a creative space to sort of like play in. I love that. I was describe my interest in business and technology as being a creative pursuit. Yes. I like that. Yeah, you're right. There's a lot of room for creativity in a space that is still trying to figure out what it is. And, you know, I think so much of like the the early attractiveness for early community members at a place like Song Camp has been sort of that environment, the freedom and openness and lack of certainty in how everything should get done and, and the type of people it attracts there. I'm curious, like, we zoom out a little bit before you fell into the Web3 rabbit hole. What were you up to? I would just touch on the key points that I feel like inform or influence where I am right now. And so a lot of my youth has been spent in DIY circles, underground scenes, punk scenes. And so all my young adult life, I've been playing in punk bands, been interfacing with different subcultures, hardcore scene, underground electronic scene. And around 2013 is when I went full-time as an artist. I did all that stuff, like album uh, releases, press cycles, touring, and then was also part of different collectives too, around like mid 2000s. That collective has been sort of like informed or shaped a lot of like how I see community in that these niche spaces were all sort of like composed of musicians, experimenters, and we would all sort of like hold shows on like Tiny Chat. I'm not sure if you're familiar with Tiny Chat. It's like a uh, an old discord or pre-discord type messaging platform with video and we would hold shows there and all the music that's being played is like weird like weird electronic music and so that sort of like gave me a peek or really informed like how i see digital communities around 2020 when the pandemic started i sort of like was in a phase in a season where it's like okay i did a thing i've done all this creative stuff what else is out there and that led me to Web3 
that led me to FWB, that led me to Rarible, and that led me to Song Camp. And so within these spaces, I sort of like contributed a little bit more of my creative spirit. I I think from then on, I've become like deeply involved in Web3 and became embedded in the ecosystem, in the community. Curious, there's a a lot of discussion, talk, tools being built around the this idea of DAO onboarding. Many folks out there in the world that are have contributed to DAOs or I think are excited about potentially contributing. I think there's sort of this like feeling of friction and uncertainty and like this opaqueness that kind of exists. And so I'm I'm really curious about your process from going from somebody who's maybe on the outside, quote unquote, to somebody who's a core contributor in an organization like SongCamp. What was that process like for you? So when you mentioned like onboarding, how I've onboarded myself, maybe. Patience is the word that comes to mind because when I initially entered the DAO space, people were were thinking about onboarding, right? But the systems are not as clear. And so there's a lot of context building going on. And the way that I see it is that the onus is on me to actually learn terminologies, learn the technology, learn also about the social layer, the social operating system of a DAO. A lot of like how DAOs work takes inspiration from decentralized or flat organizations that came before it, like co-ops, for example, sociocracy, holacracy. And so it was really me when I was onboarding, okay, I've tried to gain firsthand experience by joining like FWB, by joining like Rarible and sort of like figure out, okay, how do these systems work? How do these orgs work? And I found that each DAO has their own culture and their own way of doing things that might have been informed by the early people who were there. And some came from like startup backgrounds, some came from the corporate backgrounds, some came from like nonprofits. And so it was really a journey of learning. And I think there's a tendency for us as DAO operators and who think about inviting contributors in I mean, there's a lot of value in making it easy, making it accessible, making it understandable. But there's also a part there that the honest is also on the people coming in to actually build context and learn how these things work. And I feel like that also involves humility as well, that, oh, I don't know what's going on, but please take a seat. You know, it's okay. It's okay to be confused. I think most of us here are also confused, you know, <laughs> so it's okay. You know, we're, we're, we're in this together. I, I think that comes to mind. In terms of like onboarding even just how you phrase that i think has been a a fairly consistent theme through the folks we've talked to so far is this sense of personal responsibility in and around it and i think that is contrary to how many are sort of thinking about that broader question of dao onboarding and and, and that it usually comes from a point of like reducing friction making it easier an idea that scale somehow wins here i think this idea of the importance of building context the necessity of, of sort of spending the time to understand the context yeah it's sort of a recognition that there's so much more human connection and the DAOs are more human than tech it's not about just signing up and going through a, a funnel to join a, a membership site like there's a whole lot of other nuance that yeah i wonder like do you think that tools are the solution to making that easier or if we we're going to make DAO onboarding easier and I think about like the, the next Mark who's going to come in and join Song Camp or, or whatever. Like, wh- and we have the magic wand. What are, we, what are we making magic on? What changes? You know, your prompt reminds me of this tweet that I saw. Uh, shout out Chase Chapman. And she was saying that currently where we're at, uh, we're using the wrong mental models, right? And she touches on the tech layer and the social layer. On the tech layer, which is very useful, we're talking about like permissionlessness or interoperability. And then on the social layer, we're talking about sociocracy, like holacracy or co-ops. And so I think that the tech and the community aspect, the social layer of it, in my understanding, are symbiotic. They each sort of like complement each other. When people ask me who have backgrounds in like activist groups or or nonprofits or co-ops, my definition of a DAO is like, yes, we could embed these social operating systems using these much more better tools, you know, that enhance trust, that enhance transparency. All of that are trust building mechanisms. I think in my current mental model, when we talk about DAOs, we're both talking about the social layer and the tech layer smashed into one. Is it something that is also similar to how you see it, Jess? 
Yeah. I mean, I think the DAOs are organizations built on different rails and organizations are a mixture of tools, tech, and human beings. Something that really stood out of my conversation with Chase the other day, we're sort of starting to tease apart that technology versus humanity thing. And I think for the magic of DAOs to really come true, we need to be able to both lean into, I think you're talking about trust building, so the social scalability of the technology of what blockchains provide. And also recognize that I think the further up the stack we get from the infrastructure layer, the more human beings play and, and probably should play. And so like thinking through the, the more human interaction points with these organizations, I think the thing that's most exciting to me, and I feel like the majority of the barriers to that evolution of DAOs right now, they're not tech-based. The solutions to those barriers will be tech-enabled, but it needs to come from both use cases driven from DAOs and human beings and majority of the friction points aren't technology based right now. But I think you sort of have to live in that nuanced world where it's like, yeah, it's both that need to move forward. Otherwise, we don't get to where we want to get to. Yes, I agree. Like it's both the tech and the social layer. On the social layer side, dude, I feel like there is a sort of paradigm shift happening, which could be a high barrier sometimes. And I acknowledge that, that a lot of us, you know, a lot of our peers come from structured hierarchical circles and of course if that's what you know it informs like how we design this space sometimes part of my day-to-day -day is to also sort of like educate people or at least share what i know this whole sort of like self-management self-organized groups well some circles operate like that even before DAOs, but it's not the status quo i think the barrier that i see there's new technology and then there's also like this novel way of working, which is like most of us are unfamiliar with. Yeah, I was just thinking about like the amount of time spent working in a hierarchical organization versus the amount of time spent in a self-manager or non-hierarchical organization, like across all of humanity is doesn't show up on that pie chart, really. There's an even more nuanced challenge that comes out of that in that we need to recognize that for some things and in some situations, hierarchy is better and or Maybe a better way of saying that is that there are trade-offs in all structures, and so being aware of those trade-offs is important. Why I'm so vocal about the need for more DAOs and that that, that is the solution to it, all of these challenges, I think, is that we just need to have more and more people working in more and more ways to both learn and experiment and also to understand those nuances. Because right now, I think we still end up with fairly ideologically driven decisions or, or structures that are probably good in the early days to get things done, but I think we're sort of moving into a phase right now where pragmatism, realism, progress, business models, all these sort of things become more and more important. And we shouldn't be afraid to make the trade-offs, I think, at least in pursuit of more detailed understanding. A thousand percent. That resonates with me. Right now, we're talking about centralized versus decentralized. And what I'm hearing is that for, for some goals, where the goal is efficiency, maybe rapidness, I think that small teams or small core teams or centralized sort of like teams could achieve that goal better. And so I am also with that notion that there might be like in an ecosystem, there might be teams that are much more centralized. There might be teams that are much more decentralized. It really depends on the goal. And I think in my experience, I've seen that when you're building a product, it's possibly a little better and a little much more faster when, the, when it's centralized. Whereas if we're talking about wider governance where the decision will affect the whole community, maybe that can be decentralized. Like you said, like, there's like nuances here. I'm careful to say like, oh, decentralized is the only way. No, it's not. <laughs> we just love to hold things as being finite in some way or binary, right? It's either gotta be this or, or the other. And I think what's most exciting now about Web3 generally is just that there are so many more potentials. The fact that for decades, the way to build a valuable startup company was to find a technology advantage, push that technology advantage, maybe build community around it, profit. And now today we can start off with this idea of community ownership or collaboration or community as like the starting point, the inspiration, the ownership point. It's not to say that one of those is better than the other necessarily. It's just to say that we now have choice. And at least this new path is actually most interesting to me right now. It's new, it's undiscovered, it's sort of a lot of question marks and opportunities around it. But I think just looking at the world today is just having many, many more nuanced options for going and applying creativity to the design of organizations and of businesses. That's the exciting part. And so like I sit in this privileged place where I get to work with 20 amazing projects on a fairly regular basis. And I'd find myself sitting there almost in this tension where people put a for the question or a challenge, 
or a solution to a challenge. And I'm like, that's really not how I would solve that challenge, but that's a really cool experiment. And I mean, this is truly my experience working with Matthew at Song Camp, right? Which is like big brain. I joke all the time about how much he frustrates me because he <laughs> comes to the table with like, I've got to figure it out. And he lays out everything on the table. And I'm like, okay, I would not do it that way. I totally get where you're coming from though. I love that experiment. We got to go do it. Let's go do it. And then two weeks later, he's like, okay, well, I got it all figured out. I'm like, wait, but I thought we had it figured out before. He's like, yeah, but. And so there's just sort of this like, <laughs> Mark's Bro. dying laughing here because I'm sure he experiences that yeah, on a regular yep, basis. Yep, but, but it is like the only, I, I just love it because it's like, yeah, like, I don't know. Mm-hmm. I don't know. That seems like a, you know, it's a logical experiment and we just get to get to be a part of perpetuating many, many, many more of these experiments. And I think we just don't have enough of those experiments out there. So let's go do it. I think that's why we have so many artists and creatives sort of playing in the space right now is because they see raw materials and you're like, well, yeah, I'm going to go make something with that. Like, why the hell wouldn't I? <laughs> <laughs> a thousand percent, a thousand percent. And I think what you're speaking to is my day to day talking with Matthew every day. It's like, okay, here's the plan. And then the next day it's like, oh, actually here's the plan. And then the next day it's like, here's the plan. For me, and maybe this speaks to like our, and you as well, Jess, you know, I know that you also have like a music background. I think it has sort of like, a, it comes from or stems from that creative spirit, right? Where it's like, like you said, we have these raw materials and we could actually shape them into however we want. And so part of that is experimenting. Part of that is iterating on it. Part of it is, is looking ahead. Okay, what else is novel? What is interesting? What could be a stepping stone into something that could be fresh or innovative? And so that's our approach, like across the whole Song Camp ecosystem, from our camps to like product design. It's like, okay, cool. What if we do this? Oh, how about this? And I know that it's almost like self selecting because not everyone operates in that way. And it could be very uncertain, very confusing too. But I feel like artists, creative people embody that naturally. To me, it's that innovative experience and that is where value is going to be created in these organizations. Once something's figured out, I think it's an easy template to apply and it becomes less interesting. I think DAOs are more the evolution of a startup than it is a membership site or a newsletter or a Facebook group. It is through the collaboration and creativity and innovation that value will be created there. And the deeper you are in the space, the more that innovation is challenged by the rapid innovation and iteration that's happening around you. And I think it probably is very much like music, right? Where there is just this abundance of creativity that you are also creating within. And I think there's sort of like a lot more nuanced innovation that happens within that highly self-referencing world. There's a lot of similarities between a lot of creative pursuits and DAOs. And so we're spending a lot of time thinking about like, what is a great project for C Club? I think about teams that are able to really take what is the new or interesting, embed that or co-opt it or embrace it or collaborate with it or use it as sort of like an inspiration point. Yeah, when I think that there's just so much more iteration to come from all these organizations, just trying to create a culture and a tech stack and a team that can kind of embrace and live within that world. And I'm actually curious, I know Song Camp has sort of been in this state of this is say figuring it out, right? Like there's been this evolution. It started with such a, an innocent idea concept and kind of just attracted a lot of attention and excitement and is sort of going on. But as somebody who's an early contributor to one of these DAOs, you sort of are forced to be very effective or at least okay with operating in uncertainty and lack of clarity. And I'm curious if you can give us some insight into how you have managed to be effective in ever evolving non-static organization what comes to mind for me is a sense of humility humility in the sense that it's okay to not have everything figured out it's okay that that some people are much more smarter than you and that you can learn from them that's a huge thing for me and that's also something that i continuously sort of like challenging myself like how can i dissolve my ego how can i actually hold this idea such that i could sort of like listen to it, understand it, and assimilate it, and then possibly add my own thoughts. I think a lot of our day-to-day, or at least my day-to-day, is like that. Okay, hearing other people, okay, here is our problem, or here is what we want to do. What else could we do? Like, what sort of approaches can we pursue? And that involves a lot of, like, challenging my own ego and challenging, like, my own sort of, like, ideas. Like, I think this is the way to, to do it. But then also, like, having that openness to sort of like actually 
say for example will who is part of our community is like will actually has a better idea which is much more elegant much more simpler why don't we do that that's something that i've learned to really just like listen first and understand what what's being said before you actually give your thoughts on it adaptability is another core value that i've learned being part of collective and distributed networks because if things are unknown if things are uncertain how can you sort of like have a mindset of sensing and feeling and looking ahead because it's unknown and all you can do is really to adapt and be flexible which is uh something that i've learned from gardening you have a garden too right jess i do actually i was a gardener professionally for a while as well wow that's amazing i think that's a connection point with us i'm a gardener but not professionally i'm a hobbyist for example, if you're sort of like planning for, for the upcoming season, or here are the vegetables and here are the plants I'm going to grow. You toil the beds, you put in fertilizer, you put in compost in there, and you're sort of like, okay, cool. And then you find out that, yeah, some plants thrive, some plants don't, and that's okay. The next season, you now know what to do. Maybe plant earlier or plant later. There's all these levers that you can implement. That involves a lot of like sensing and knowing, and knowing the seasons, knowing everything, one has to be adaptable and flexible. And I really love that Seed Club is using a lot of those like gardening metaphors because like to me, ah, yes, that's right. It totally makes sense to me. There's an ongoing challenge within Seed Club about how much should we be leaning into the gardening metaphors. There are many that can be made. It shouldn't be surprising that we're seeing things like seasons be tools used by DAOs to define and iterate and compress that learning experience that truly happens over many, many months or years in, in the garden context directly. And I guess will probably happen in the same way for, for DAOs, but trying to tackle that as far as like a core organizational tenant, I think makes a ton of sense. There's sort of like, you know, so much of decision-making organization authority to a degree within DAOs is based on social relationships that exist in there. And so I think there's this idea of flat hierarchy or hierarchy list organizations. And I just don't think that that's the reality that we're seeing anywhere within within DAOs, whether that's articulated through an org structure or it is sort of emergent through certain people's abilities, their, their time they're able to put in, the information they might have, et cetera. These sort of structures exist. And, but there is sort of like this ideological drive and belief that fighting against that inherited belief around hierarchy, I think, is pretty consistent in, in most of the organizations I work in. And so the most important piece and what I'm kind of leading up to here is this trust in others in the organization as it's almost like a metric for how effective a team is going to be. And I'm curious, from my understanding, sort of hold this role within Song Camp, either officially or unofficially, of trust builder. Community building, in my mind, is, is very much about building trust. And even just in, in a number of your answers here, it highlights that. I'm curious how you think about stewarding trust within an organization that, for context, Song Camp goes like there's these sort of big inflection points where the community kind of shrinks back down to die hardcore believers. And all of a sudden you do a camp and there's like a whole bunch of new blood that comes in. So I'm curious on how you build trust. I think trust is built primarily through interactions with people. And that could be one-on-one -on -one interactions. That could be like group interactions that are repeated over time. It's like the same approach as friendship. The more that we talk to each other, the more that we become vulnerable to each other, the more that we sort of depend on each other. That could also be applied into larger groups. How can we have repeat interactions with each other? How can we exhibit pro-social behaviors with each other? How do we care about each other? How can we be transparent with each other? Also, like how can our information flow frictionlessly from different teams and, and that becomes a challenge as organizations and DAO sort of like scale and, and, and evolve. I think what comes to mind is I guess the model of like circles, pods, and I think a lot of our space has been talking about that, you know, mini DAOs, sub DAOs, etc. Connected to trust, like well how do we, because information is trust also, how can the information flow from each circle having this sort of like infinity loop I guess those are the things that come to mind in terms of like trust building. I would love to hear on your end, like what is trust building to you? I love this because I'm like, how the hell would I answer that question? I love where you went with it. I don't think I would have answered information. And yet I think that is such an important piece. And if we think about the biggest friction to trust or to progress or collaboration, information asymmetry, I think is, is the big challenge. One where that I think will always exist, but that we also have to fight against it 
constantly and and that fight is worthwhile even though it will always sort of be a, a losing effort ultimately because yeah you're right i just think back to moments where either there's some conflict or disagreement and just the incredible power of conversation and discussion and sort of leaning in and, and trying to understand where other people are coming from and, and just how effective that can be in, in sort of diffusing or, or solving those problems. And if I sort of zoom that out a bit and think about the structural situations that we're creating within DAOs, the point of friction or, or conflict almost inevitably is going to be a, where a lack of communication or a lack of trust. And, and underneath that, I think is a lack of, of communication. The idea of how or reduce information asymmetry is a tool of building trust, I think is fascinating. And even on a, on a higher level, right? Like there's sort of trust building that needs to get done within these organizations, but there's also like an external brand, let's just call that trust as well, right? Where, you know, my hope is somebody sees Song Camp or C Club and they go, that's dope. I've heard about them before. I trust those guys. I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt or I want to buy their tokens or I want to be a part of this thing. And again, that's about clear communication and and there's trade-offs that happen in all those, which I think is super interesting. A thousand percent, man. I mean, you touching on like communication, touching on like, how do we resolve conflicts, right? I guess a lot of my organizational thinking comes from like teal organizations, self-managed groups, and they value communication a lot. I was reading a chapter from Reinventing Organizations, and they were talking about the conflict resolution, like how do we resolve conflicts? And their design is so simple and elegant, and the core of it is really communication. And there's like different steps. One would be like, if you have an issue with someone, you talk to them directly and you resolve that issue between yourselves. And then from there, if that is not resolved, it then escalates into like a mediator, third party mediator, and then a panel mediation, and then finally an arbitrator. And so all of these steps in these designs, it's like you talk to the person first, talk to them directly and resolve the issue first and not involve everyone into this like issue, which I feel like that's something that I guess if you're someone who comes from the corporate world, you go to HR directly. <laughs> I have a problem with this person. This person is not working. But in self-organized groups, it's like, no, you talk to the person directly. The onus is on you to talk to them. Which is interesting. I feel like to some of us, may not be natural. Yeah, I think it's not natural for many folks. The idea even just saying conflict is, is something that can make people want to just turn away. And I got to say, I'm not the biggest fan of conflict personally. But I do think like as an early contributor, you're obviously a, a leader in Song Camp, whether you like it or not. There is this sense of responsibility for living, demonstrating, being an example of how to operate in these organizations. And, and there's sort of this dual wielding challenge of both A, trying to figure it out and then be being a good example. Are you conscious of that type of action? Are you consciously trying to be a good example in the leadership role that you have in Song Camp? Or is that more of an unconscious thing? I guess I don't take this role lightly. In fact, I actually hold it sacred. If people are depending on me for something, then I have to do it the best that I can in the most honest way that I can. I carry these responsibilities and take them really seriously. A part of me is, is also sort of like caring for the self. Because if you're caring for community, and I'm pretty sure you might also feel this way, it's not easy to hold the community. <laughs> it's not easy to think about them like almost every day. And how do we hold space for people? How do we hold space for them to be creative? It takes a lot of emotional energy and cognitive energy. And so before one gives, I think you also have to give to yourself. And, and to me, I, I make it a point to really care for myself. If it's off work hours, it's off work hours. I'm not responding to any of your messages. If it's the weekend, I am not online at all. And the way that I see this, like, because I give my soul to it. I give my whole soul to the community. And so if I don't have stuff or I don't have like space for myself, how can I give fully? That's how I see sort of like leadership in terms of, of this space. I feel like a lot of our peers sometimes forget that, forget to take care of themselves because it's just like, oh man, everyone's depending on me. Oh, I need to respond to this. Oh, there's an issue here, you know, and, and there's value to that, and, you know, in, in rapid response. But I, I hope that they don't forget that they're also human too with their own needs. Yeah, I feel like you're the C Club team talking to me right now. <laughs> i'm off a fresh two week probably the first two weeks that i've had meaningful downtime in mm. the last two years and that was due to 
getting COVID. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Guess what? You're timing out. But yeah, I think actually that, that's like my big lesson out of that is just like if you have a great team, which I think respectively we both do, right? There's incredible human beings that are, are working for in and around it, both of the organizations that we're involved in. Guess what? Talented people can not only ensure that the train stays on the track, but actually better at many things than I am. To me, that's like the, you know, we talk about trust building and we talk about sort of like the role of leadership in these organizations. And that's really where my mind goes is, is in creating space. Space was given to me to be early in this thing. And now I have the opportunity to give that space to others and they have the opportunity to create that space for others. And so, you know, this idea of, I mean, we, we call our, our team leads stewards specifically because their goal isn't to make the decisions or a goal isn't to get the things done. Their job is to create the environment in which those decisions get made and those things get done and the information gets shared and, and, and we're able to kind of come together as this ever growing collective of collectives that are aimed towards the, the same thing. And so whether on, on purpose, which I think I, I have done, but also accidentally due to being sick, you sort of create the space and people step up into that space. And I think, that moment of, of feeling to me that when I work with our early project teams, that is a, an inflection point that I'm just so excited to be on a path with them when they get to to achieve. Where you, I always describe it as like logging into Discord and seeing a chat, like a 30 person live chat happening that you had no idea was even yeah. happening or what was going on. And yeah. you're just like, okay, well, I just kind of want to listen to what's going on here, but also kind of don't because I want to give them space. And, and it's just like that moment of this thing taking taking its own thing. And earlier this week, we did a strategy type session and I had this moment of just looking around the table digitally and just seeing like these incredible human beings that I respect so much for their talent and the way that they are pouring their hearts and souls into the creation of this thing that was nothing more than a nascent idea in a telegram group like a year and a half ago. And to, it's just fucking mind blowing. It was just this moment of like emotionality kind of came over me because like, what? <laughs> and then you think about like, this is happening time and time and time again, right? And it's this like, to me, that's like the, if I could just bottle up the why, why build community first, why, why ownership matters, why DAOs, that's the why. Because yes. there's this like, we're all in it. We all have a stake in it. We see an opportunity. We're taking advantage of this gift that has sort of bestowed itself upon us for whatever reason and there's this mutual respect and, and appreciation that yeah it's just so incredible thousand percent it's like when you touched on that experience of yours like seeing your team actually gathering together and actually making their own decisions it's such a beautiful thing like i share that too like i see all these uh, conversations going on in our server these meetings and the, the question for me is like do i need to be there i don't need to be there I don't need to be there. And I feel like it's uh, it, it also challenges the ego. It's like, oh, you know, I am needed. I, I am here. But then in reality, it's like, I don't need to be there. They could take care of it. And I think that involves like humility and trust. I was like, yeah, they got it. They got it. Which also makes me think about product design and community design. Whenever I design something within Song Camp, I leave holes enough. I just create the skeleton. And then you guys fill it out, which sort of like mimics my music process when I'm working with a vocalist. Leave the instrumental as open enough as possible so they could fill in the pockets. So <laughs> my management advice in a similar vein is sometimes it's important to just not show up. Maybe that's not the best advice. I like the idea of designing for gaps or spaces. Like that's a lot more proactive and <laughs> probably empowering than just like <laughs> not showing up. But but my not showing up advice is well earned in that one day I just didn't show up. Not on purpose. I just didn't show up. And guess what? Better outcome happened than if I was there. And I know there's sort of this like mixture of as an entrepreneur, it's so important, I think, to have a sense of responsibility and like, I'm going to make this work. Yet, it can also almost be sort of myopic, right? And that I am the only person who can make this work. My ideal DAO founding team is a whole bunch of people who are like, I got to make this work but that don't share that idea that I am the only one that can make this work. Absolutely, and that's something that I share also. I wanna make this work. I have a plan, guys. Like you said, you know, it might be myopic, it might be narrow. I feel like there's a lot of value in seeing like other perspectives too. Like the idea becomes much more well-rounded rather than this like singular thing. Also, it depends, <laughs> you know, what sort of goal are we sort of like trying to do? Like if it's a product with a specific sort of outcome, then maybe that's a different approach. 
improv is how we build DAOs because you're right. Like the product team within C club needs to have a strong opinion and it's probably not going to benefit from 42 people joining in there. Same thing with like working with our early stage projects, throwing a thousand human beings at early stage projects is not remotely useful, right? But throwing the right three people is incredibly useful. And so, so much of the, the, that sort of figuring out and the complexity of it all is that we need to have both of those types of things operating in a similar environment and being cohesive. And I think that's sort of where, where the, the superpower comes from. Because I think about those DAOs that are building much more product team centric and, and you know, we get to work with a number of them. There's some great ones out there. They're creating great products. Would those products be more powerful if community felt like they had a meaningful ownership or, or say in it? Probably. The big question in my mind is just like when and how. And I think that's kind of where we're, we're sort of doing that dance right now where there's this two distinct, like we're going to build community first, community decisions, collective, et cetera. And then there's like, no, we're going to have a strong opinion. We're going to you know make a lot of progress. And at some point, those things are going to cross over into sort of the opposite sides. So we have you know, one building community first and one building product first. And I think the integration point is really where most of the value gets unlocked, but I don't know when or how that should be done. And I think there's just a lot of experiments in that pursuit right now, which is exciting. It's interesting because it reminds me of FWB when you said that organizations or groups need to have an opinion. And I could sense that there are groups in there within the DAO, within FWB, that have clear opinions. Like this is what it should be. Say, for example, editorial. Here's how it should look like. And here's this, the voice that we're, we're using. And I feel like that's an opinion. And here are the topics or things that we're going to talk about. And that's really valuable, even with art too. Like curation is important in music as well. Curation is important. Does, does it actually have a narrative that is aligned to say the collective? Say, for example, if you're a label that is known for say weird electronic music, then it has to have an opinion. You, you, you like when you create a playlist, it, it's not always just like random stuff. It needs to be something that's like cohesive and tells a story. That's what comes to mind when we talk about that. One of my meme sayings that it's parroted back to me often is I have an opinion because I apparently have a lot of opinions. And I think, yeah, this last week in C Club has been really about appreciating strong opinions, like how valuable strong opinions are if they're held in the space of respect and collaboration. I've been really thinking about the importance and, and the methodology around encouraging those strong opinions more broadly. Demonstrating that a little bit because I think like, I know people have strong opinions how do we make sure that we get them out? Because they're not useful in our individual heads. That's where structure and methodologies really need to start to, to come to play, I think, to, to create the spaces for that to happen. And so, again, coming back to like, you know, where, where is like the unlock happen in the space? I think it, it is, you know, you mentioned self-management quite a bit. I think there's just an immense amount of, of learning and experience that still needs to be adopted by some of our early organizations in the DAO space that really lean into the, the social and human aspect of this stuff and then build dope tools around it. You know, what comes to mind is like a governance practice called like consent-based governance, which I think is being applied by a lot of like sociocratic uh, organizations. And the, the main core of consent-based governance is not asking for consensus. It is asking, if I present an idea to you, I present a proposal, I am looking for objections to it. And identifying where the objections are, articulating it, naming it, and then the onus is on the objector to actually make this proposal better. It gives a lot of like responsibility to whoever is critiquing. Yes, you can have a strong opinion. Yes, you can critique it. Yes, you can object to it, but how can this be better? And I think the main goal for consent-based governance is that, is this safe to try, guys? Uh, of course, you know, not every DAO decision needs to be like that. But I feel like for, for something that involves like rapid deployment, that could be something that we can use in our space. I'm curious, like, like you are somebody who engages with the philosophy, ideology, um, the, the thoughtfulness, I guess, in, in the space. I'm curious, what are some resources or where are you looking for inspiration these days? I do read a lot of books. And most of the books that I've been reading right now are in org design. And so Reinventing Organizations is one. I first heard about that book over at MCON, which I think we you also spoke there. Um, my mind was blown. I was like, I need to get this book. I need to get this book. 
And so that whole book, uh, I feel like it's almost like a Bible to me, or at least a jumping off point to see like what other sort of like novel ways of being together and being in community together, of working together. That has become like, like a source of inspiration for me. What else have I been sort of like reading and consuming right now? Ah, I've gotten this book. It's called Radio Silence, and it outlines or, or tells the history of the American hardcore scene from 1980s to the early 2000s. And that was a big, I mean, I was part of that subculture and I feel like I still am, you know, by, at heart. I'm still a punk. But just hearing that story of how these bands organized together, how they pulled their resources together and to actually create a culture around them is so fascinating to me. So that's another point of like inspiration. I, I love that because I, I think I have this, these moments every once in a while where I just sort of start laughing at the game that we're playing here because, you know, there, there's so much being able to see like a, a trend before it happens, see all the things that go into it. And then all of a sudden seeing it hit big is such a, a crazy experience. I think NFTs were a very clear sort of packaging of that for me. And, and then you can sort of start to see those early stages starting to take shape again right now and not as if they're predictors necessarily but you can start to see like the initial energy or, or materials that could go into that right and everybody playing the game playing their role playing sort of this explorer slash promoter slash speculator slash long-term investor slash creator i think that's fascinating and, and i can imagine that book captures that sort of experience well i've heard a number of people sort of refer to the punk scene and as, as sort of like a an inspiration or at least like a, a gateway into the space and I've always enjoyed my conversations with those folks. So yeah, Mark, man, I appreciate you spending it just a bit over an hour of your day with me here and with us. Look at it with us. There's so many other people. This intimate one-on-one -on -one conversation that gets to be shared with thousands. How exciting is that? Um, really appreciate all the work that you put into the space and the way that you do it and for you sharing your time with us here today. Uh, where, where can we direct people? Where should they be finding you on the internet or things that you care about? Well, first, Jess, thank you for having me here. I really appreciate the space and I'm really, I was very excited to actually like talk to you one-on-one -on -one and, and I'm grateful that we, that we have this conversation and I'm hoping for many more. I want to shout out Nicole <laughs> from Seed Club, Samsonite. I feel like we share, you know, with, within Seed Club and Song Club, we share like members. And so this feels like family. And so I want to give them a shout out. Where can people find me? Twitter at Mark Redito, and then uh, my website, markredito.com. I have like a digital garden in my website where I sort of just explore fragments of ideas, pieces of music, et cetera, et cetera. And of course you have a Wikipedia page, which everybody should go check out and make <laughs> ridiculous edits too. <laughs> Didn't even realize that. I'm like, Mark's got a Wikipedia page? <laughs> who even is it? Like there's, who even is this guy? <laughs> your instagram image i'm just i'm dying here so yes go give just google the mark mark redito on the googles and uh well you'll have at least minutes of entertainment maybe hours uh, mark appreciate you again man and uh look forward to seeing you on the internet thank you jess folks before you go we made a little thing it's called the c club job board i feel like that undersells it a little bit this is a touch point for us to make all sorts of work and collaboration experiences from within the C-Club ecosystem available to you, dear reader. It's at network.cclub.xyz. That's network.cclub.xyz. You should go check it out right now if you're a part of the C-Club network. Let's get some jobs up on this job board if you're looking for a way to contribute to some of the most exciting social DAOs out there, network.cclub.xyz. Go check it out.